Unit 1. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions 1 to 8, choose the best answer, A, B or C. 1. You hear a man and a woman talking. When should the man go to Belize? A. Between November and May. B. Between June and October. C. In February. I heard that you went to Belize a few months ago. How was it? It was absolutely wonderful. I went in February, which is the high tourist season, so there were a lot of people. But I did so many things. I went scuba diving in the coral reefs, I visited the Mayan temples in the area, and I even slept in the National Zoo on a special overnight tour. Wow, it sounds amazing. I would definitely plan on going, but not in February like you when all the tourists go. Do you know when would be a good time? Well, November to May is the high tourist season, so avoid going then. Two. You hear a man talking. Why do most tourists go to Lake Plastira? A. To hike in the surrounding area. B. To go canoeing. C. To enjoy the view. Lake Plastira in Thessaly, Greece, is an artificial lake that was created in 1960. It is 14 kilometers long and 65 meters deep. It is ideal for exciting getaways and especially attractive to those who appreciate the great outdoors. Canoeing, which brings the majority of tourists to the lake, offers visitors the chance to enjoy a different view of the surrounding area. There is no set level of difficulty, since the distance and intensity can be chosen according to each person's physical condition. You can go to the lake's islets, where you can even leave your canoe, and explore them on foot. Three, you hear a woman talking. Who can stay in the lounge? A, British Airways passengers with children. B, all British Airways passengers. C, business and first class passengers of British Airways. As of March 2008, British Airways premium passengers enjoy the extreme comfort of six new lounges at Heathrow Airport. The luxury lounge complex can hold up to 2,500 people. It is open to all business and first class passengers. The lounges include a boardroom, ensuite bedrooms, a spa and even a cinema. The lounges also offer complete office facilities with internet connection and numerous computers and printers. Business travellers will particularly appreciate the news zone, where all the major British newspapers and magazines can be found. For young travellers, there is even a children's room with two plasma screens and a PlayStation. hear a man and a woman talking. What does the man think about the spa? A. He thinks his wife will like it. B. He wants to spend most of his time there. C. He would rather send his wife there alone. So what was Mauritius like? Well, we stayed in the Shanti Ananda Spa, and believe me, it was amazing. We both spent our days getting massages, lounging on the private beach, and enjoying the healthy cuisine. We left feeling completely relaxed and totally refreshed. Sounds interesting. My wife's birthday is coming up, and I was thinking of taking her somewhere special. 
She's always wanted to go to a spa. And the idea of staying on an island appeals to me as well. I don't think I will spend much time in the spa, though, as I prefer scuba diving, hiking, and being outdoors. But it is her birthday present, so I guess I should consider what she would like best. Five. You hear a woman talking about the Airbus A380. What is she doing when she speaks? A. Encouraging people to travel on the Airbus A380. B. Giving information about the Airbus A380. C. Discussing the positive and negative features of the Airbus A380. Airbus A380 is the newest and most modern aeroplane on the market. This double-deck aeroplane can carry up to 853 passengers. It features 10 seats per row in economy class and 6 seats per row in business class. First class cabins are also available, which feature large beds, showers and even a minibar. Offices with computer rooms and internet access are also located on the upper deck. Most importantly, these new planes are also environmentally friendly, as they produce less carbon dioxide than most planes and consume less fuel. So far, almost 200 Airbus A380s have been ordered by various airlines. Soon, these luxury planes will be taking off and landing at all major airports around the world. Six, you hear a man and a woman talking. What does the man think of the hotel? A, he would like to visit it only for a day. B, he wants to stay in it overnight. C, he thinks it's not worth visiting. Have you heard of the Hotel Everland in Paris? No. What's special about it? Well, it's a movable hotel that has only one room. It's located on the roof of a high-rise building and has a spectacular view of the entire city of Paris. Every three to four months, the hotel is moved to the top of another building. You can book the room for the night or just visit it during the day. One room? Well, that sounds silly to me. I would visit it for a day, but not stay in it. Well, it's nicer than it sounds. It's got a king-size bed, a bathroom, and a lounge. They even deliver breakfast to your door. Seven. You hear a man and a woman talking. Which of the following is most likely to happen? A. They will travel around Europe together. B. They will visit the same countries in Europe. C. They will both buy a Eurail ticket in the future. Have you heard of Eurail? Of course. It is a system that offers passes for train travel throughout Europe. My cousin and I bought a one-month ticket last summer and travelled to Portugal and Spain. It was absolutely wonderful. I'm going to do it again next summer. I'm going to buy a three-month ticket and travel around Europe with my brother. We want to stop in different countries like Spain, France and Italy. I've always liked travelling by train. And I can't think of a better way to see Europe. Eight. You hear a man talking on the radio. Who would the information he is giving interest most? A. People living in Geneva. B. People travelling to Geneva. C. Geography and art teachers. Geneva is definitely Switzerland's most cosmopolitan city. It is 
built next to a lake of the same name, where you can see the famous Jet d'eau fountain. The old city is proud of its unique landmarks, the most famous being Saint Pierre's Cathedral. There are many museums, such as the Art and History Museum, the Natural History Museum, and even the Museum of the Red Cross. If you are in a shopping mood, Geneva is known for its watches, its chocolates, its Swiss Army knives, and its cigars. Also, Geneva is known for its famous restaurants. You must not leave without trying the delicious Swiss cheese fondue at the Café du Soleil. Unit 2 You will hear a conversation between a teenager who has just come out of the London dungeon and a man who is writing a report on London's tourist attractions. Excuse me, my name is Alan Wells, and I am writing a report on London's best tourist attractions. I see you've just come out of the London Dungeon. Could I just ask you a few questions about your visit? It won't take long. Yes, okay. Why not? Thank you very much. First of all, a few details. How old are you? Seventeen. And you are female? As you can see. <laughs> did you go into the dungeon on your own, or did you go in a group? I went in with my sister and two other friends of mine. We are all here on holiday together. Okay, great. So, had you heard about the London Dungeon before this visit? No, I hadn't. My aunt told me about it and said we really should come. How long did your visit last? Well, we were probably in there for nearly two hours altogether. But when I was inside, I had no idea, really. You get moved on from room to room with your group. But I never felt like I was being rushed through. How did you enjoy your visit? Oh, it was fantastic. It was really scary, but very funny at the same time. Can you describe what you enjoyed most about it? Well, I didn't really know what to expect. So when we arrived, we were a bit surprised that there was a huge queue of people waiting to get in. That was one part I didn't like. How long did you have to wait? It must have been about 45 minutes, but it wasn't too bad, I suppose. Other people told me that they had been before, and they had waited much longer. I suppose it depends on the time of year. Well, anyway, once we got in, it was just amazing. Inside, it is really dark, even before you get to the ticket counter, which makes it really scary. What did you do inside the dungeon? Well, the whole dungeon was divided up into different rooms. And in each place, there were actors dressed up in costume, just as they would have been dressed up in the past. They told us a lot about the history of London and the way people lived then. Such as? Well, in one room, they told us about the Great Plague. It was an illness which spread through London and killed lots of people. It was brought in by rats, and they even had live rats in there. Ugh! <laughs> They told us about the Great Fire of London, which actually killed all the rats which had brought the illness in, so it was educational too. And what else was there to do? Well, there were rides and people jumping out at you trying to scare you, and they really did scare us. We were screaming like little kids, but it was great fun too. Would you say it is suitable for young children? No way. They actually say at the entrance that they strongly advise against taking small children in. I think it is perfect for teenagers and adults, as long as you are not too nervous. So, would you recommend the London Dungeon to others? Oh yes, absolutely. 
It was quite expensive to get in, but it was definitely worth it. It was fantastic. Great. Well, thanks very much for your time. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. You'll hear five different people talking about why they visited or moved to a particular place. Choose from the list A to F the statement that best describes each speaker's experience. Use the letters only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. One. I'd always wanted to visit Australia, and when my friend Sarah, who lives in Sydney, invited me to her wedding, I accepted the invitation immediately. I arrived in Sydney about a week before the wedding, and spent as much time as possible taking in the sights. The Sydney Opera House was one of the highlights of my trip. I went on a guided tour of the various theatres, and I watched a musical. I also went to the Sydney Aquarium. There's a glass chamber in the aquarium that allows visitors to get a close look at some incredible sea creatures, including sharks. All in all, my holiday was wonderful, and I really enjoyed Sarah's wedding. My only regret is that I never got to see a kangaroo. Speaker 2 When I received a letter informing me that I'd been accepted into the College of Dramatic Arts in New York City, I was absolutely thrilled. Still, as excited as I was, I was also a little nervous about leaving home and moving to a new place all by myself. My first day in New York was overwhelming. It's a fast-paced city, and it can be quite a challenge keeping up. It took me a few months to settle in, and there were times when I felt quite homesick. Now I am thoroughly enjoying my studies, and I've just been chosen for the lead role in a play that's being produced at the college. Who knows, maybe one day you'll see me performing in a play on Broadway. Now wouldn't that be something? Speaker 3 I'd been working as an archaeologist for about a year when I heard that Professor Harold Jones, a world-famous scientist, was putting together a team of experts to help him search for a lost city in Mexico. It had always been my dream to work with Professor Jones, so I immediately handed in my resignation and booked a ticket to Mexico. My plan was to convince the professor to let me be part of his team, even though I wasn't very experienced. Luckily, the professor was quite impressed with my CV and decided to give me a job. I've been in Mexico for six months now. It's been a wonderful learning experience for me, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Speaker 4 I'm a writer, and I had been struggling to come up with a suitable ending for my latest book, so my publisher suggested that I go away for a while. I decided to rent a small cabin near Lake Winston, which is about a two-hour drive from the town where I live. I spent most of my time at the lake swimming, fishing, and admiring the glorious sunsets. The scenery was so beautiful that I took as many photos as I could. I must say the experience definitely stimulated my creativity. And by the time I returned home, I had thought of a brilliant ending for my book. Funnily enough, when my publisher saw the photos that I had taken, she told me she wanted to include them in a book on outdoor adventures. I had no idea I was such a skilled photographer. Speaker 5 I've been working as an accountant for about 10 years, and I have to admit that adding and subtracting numbers all day long can get a little boring. Last summer, I decided it was time for an adventure. So I took a month off and went to stay with my cousin at his farm. 
I've always loved animals and was thrilled when my cousin agreed to let me help it with some of the chores. I was even allowed to milk the cows and feed the pigs. Being so close to nature was wonderful and there were moments during my holiday when I could clearly imagine myself giving up my job in the city and moving to the country. <laughs> Maybe one day. Module 1 Roundup You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions 1 to 8, choose the best answer, A, B or C. 1. You hear a man talking about an experience he had a few years ago. What does he describe? A. Driving his car in a snowstorm. B. A coach trip in winter. C. A taxi ride up a mountain. It was in 1998 when I was living in Greece teaching English. It was a cold, wet February afternoon. I was being driven from the town of Volos to a village perched high on the slopes of Mount Pelion. Once past the drab outskirts of the town, the road began to climb steeply. The rain soon turned to sleet and then to snow. From the warmth of the inside of the cab, I peered out into what now was a blinding white snow-covered landscape. The long and winding road continued onwards and upwards into what seemed to be a blizzard. I could now see no further than an arm's length from the window. The driver had reduced the speed of the car to a mere crawl. He slapped the steering wheel with his hand and shouted out loud. Two. You overhear a conversation between two friends on holiday in Thailand. What is James's attitude towards Gary's problem? A. He sympathizes with him. B. He finds the situation funny. C. He is trying to be helpful. Good grief, James. I can't believe it. This is not my backpack. What do you mean it's not yours? Whose is it then? It's the same make and colour as mine, but it's definitely older. The colour has faded slightly. Look, here's the label. Carl Rasmussen Stockholm. Blast! I must have picked up the wrong one when we all got off the minibus from the bungalows in Koh Lanta to get the boat to Kofi Fee. Well, Gary, it seems likely your backpack is on its way to Sweden by now. Oh, no. What am I going to do? What am I going to wear? All my favourite summer clothes gone. The Paul Smith summer collection, shirts, jeans, my Calvins. Never mind. Open your new backpack. There might be a Swedish collection in there. Bjornborg socks. This is not a laughing matter, you know. Three. Listen to an announcement of a ferry departure at a port. What is its main purpose? A. To warn about the weather conditions. B. To announce that the boat is late. C. To inform passengers the boat is leaving. This is the final call for all passengers of the high-speed ferry Pegasus traveling to Cherbourg this evening. All remaining passengers are requested to report immediately to Immigration Control and Customs for embarkation. Normandy Ferries would like to apologize for the late departure of the Pegasus. This is due to the late arrival of the vessel from France. Normandy ferries are pleased to report that weather conditions have now improved and the normal sailing time to Sherbrooke is expected. 4. You hear two friends talking on the phone. What does Catherine do? A. She gives Bill some advice. B. 
She discourages Bill. C. She apologises to Bill. Hello? Hi, it's Bill. I'm a fool. A prize fool. You'll never believe what I've gone and done. I've been in London three days and I'm due in Moscow for a very important business meeting tomorrow. My flight leaves at 10 o'clock tonight. I can't find my passport. I phoned immigration at the airport and there's no way they're going to let me on the plane without a passport. It's going to take at least a week to get a replacement. What am I going to do? I'm sorry to say this, Bill, but you're so unreliable. Anyway, stay calm and try to think logically. Your passport must be somewhere. Have you checked your suitcases? Well, now retrace your steps over the last three days. Note down all the places you visited, then look up their phone numbers. I'll phone the local police station and bus garage in case it has been handed in. Five. You overhear a conversation at an airport check-in desk. How does the man respond to the customer? A. In a friendly and unprofessional manner. B. In a polite and professional manner. C. In an unhelpful and unsympathetic manner. What do you mean, young man? Explain yourself. I can't take this bag on the plane as hand luggage. Let me tell you, I have been taking this bag or at least a bag of a similar size on the flight to Edinburgh for over 30 years. Before you were born, I should think. I'm terribly sorry, madam. I would like to help you, but these are the new security regulations that were introduced by the government last week. The bag is more than twice the permitted size. Here is a leaflet which explains everything. I will be more than happy to check in the bag. You expect me to hang around at baggage reclaim in Edinburgh for hours and knowing this airline's reputation for losing luggage? No, I just won't accept it. Get me the manager. Of course, madam, certainly. Now, if you'll just stand aside, I'll... Six. Listen to two friends talking on their first night in London. Which of the following do both girls like? A. English food. B. The place they are staying at. C. Mrs. McLean's daughter. Are you asleep yet, Maria? Not yet, but I am tired. It's been such an exciting day. Let's try and get some sleep. We have an early start at the language school. The first lesson is at nine and breakfast here is at eight. I wonder what an English breakfast will be like. Better than an English dinner, I hope. All that boiled food, boiled potatoes, boiled cabbage, boiled meat. I found it all really tasteless. Still, I didn't see any fast food shops near here. And aren't the houses here so small? And they all look the same. And our bedroom, it's tiny. My bedroom at home is four or five times bigger. We're in London and this is a typical traditional terraced house. I rather like it. It's quaint. And they are a really friendly host family. Mrs. McLean and her daughter, Tracy. Thank goodness Tracy came to the airport to meet us or we would have never found our way on public transport. She seems to be a nice girl. I expected her to be colder and more distant, but she's really friendly. Seven. You overhear this conversation. Where have the man and the woman met before? A. In a hospital. B. On a glacier. C. In a park. Hello, Mr. Spencer. How are you? Much better, thank you. How is your leg? It's much better, and I have started running in the local park. 
Be careful. You must build up your strength. I know you are a famous climber, but when you slipped down that Austrian glacier and they brought you to our hospital, you were not in a very healthy condition at all. Eight. You overhear a woman telling a friend about a restaurant she went to while she was on holiday. What did she dislike the most? A. The company. B. The service. C. The food. The decor was lovely, but that was about it, I'm afraid. The waiter was utterly hopeless. He kept getting our order wrong, and at one point almost spilled red wine all over me. I should have left, but I didn't want to upset the people I was with. Anyway, the terrible service was nothing compared to the food, though. I ordered the beef, and it was horribly underdone. In fact, it was bright red. I asked them to cook it a little more, and when they finally brought it back to me, it was burnt to a crisp. I ended up nibbling on the vegetables, and they tasted awful. That restaurant was the worst part of the whole holiday. Unit 3. You will hear part of a radio interview with Alan Stapleton, a legal expert who will talk about strange or stupid laws throughout the world. For questions 1 to 7, choose the best answer, A, B or C. My guest today is Alan Stapleton, a legal expert who will tell us about strange laws that exist in many parts of the world. Welcome to the show, Alan. Thank you. Let's begin with some strange laws that exist all over the world which concern cars, drivers, bicycles and roads in general. What can you tell us about them? The list is endless. In Australia, for example, it is illegal to leave your car keys in an unattended vehicle. Why is that? Probably the police are concerned about the increasing number of car thefts, or even joyriders stealing cars and then driving around for fun, causing accidents. Moreover, in Canada, it is considered illegal to work on your car doing mechanical repairs in the street. Perhaps the authorities are concerned about noise pollution, or the fact that expensive neighborhoods might start to resemble mechanical workshops or garages. They may also be concerned about safety issues in case someone gets injured. Talking about safety, in Mexico, bicycle riders may not leave either foot off the pedals as they may lose control and cause an accident. And in Connecticut, USA, you may be stopped for cycling faster than 100 kilometers per hour. That sounds incredible. Is it possible that a person can cycle faster than 100 kilometers per hour for the law to apply? Well, I really doubt it. Anyway, coming to Europe now, in Germany, it is illegal for your car to run out of petrol on the famous Autobahn, or super-fast motorways. I can understand their logic, because any stationary cars could cause serious accidents and pile-ups. Similarly, I accept the fact that in the UK, lorries transporting cows or sheep may only be driven along the motorways between 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. with police permission, as at this time of the day there is less traffic and it is considered to be safer to transport animals then. In Hawaii, California, Nevada and Florida, you may be booked for driving too slowly, as once again, these drivers may slow down the flow of traffic and cause accidents. I read somewhere that it is illegal for a driver to be blindfolded while driving or operating a vehicle in the U.S. But who would drive a car while blindfolded? Nobody. 
Still, remaining in the US, I am puzzled as to why a driver may not drive barefooted, though. That certainly is odd. What about other parts of the world? Asia, for example? Well, in Thailand, you must wear a shirt while driving a car. I suppose that one must appear respectable at all times, no matter what the weather conditions may be. Are there any other strange laws concerning dress code or clothes in general? Well, in Italy, it is considered to be illegal for a man to wear a skirt. And in Australia, it is unlawful to roam the streets wearing black clothes and shoe polish on your face. Regarding the latter, these items are the tools of a cat burglar, so it is obvious to see why the law exists. However, I am puzzled why in Oxford, Ohio in the US, it is unlawful for a lady to appear in public with unshaven legs or face. Similarly, why do people in New York State have to purchase a license before hanging their washing out to dry on a clothesline? Hmm, sounds strange. What about animal laws? There must be some strange ones, I guess. Certainly, especially in the US. In Louisiana, you may not tie an alligator to a fire hydrant. And if you live in North Carolina, you can't use elephants to plow cotton fields. In Oklahoma, it is illegal to transport a bowl of fish on a public bus or to transport the hind legs of farm animals in the boot of one's car. Even making funny faces at dogs is considered worthy of a fine. It seems that the animal rights lobbyists have fought hard for the protection of animal rights there. Yes, but maybe that's a bit extreme. Anyway, what about some strange laws concerning food? I think there were some really funny ones in the past, right? In the UK, during the reign of Edward VI, anyone who was caught breaking a hard-boiled egg at the short end was sent to the stocks. That sounds extreme, and thankfully, that law doesn't exist anymore. However, in the US, even today, you may not have an ice cream cone in your back pocket during business hours. I think that this is obviously due to health and safety reasons. In Singapore, you may be fined $600 for dropping or deliberately throwing chewing gum onto pavements. That is quite a severe penalty. However, I bet their streets are much cleaner than ours. I agree. Just imagine how clean our streets, pavements and the general environment would be if this strange law were to be enforced everywhere. Well, that's all very interesting. But before we continue, I would just like to ask you... Unit 4. You are going to hear a radio program about a motorcycle rally. You will hear the program in several parts. After each part, you will hear some questions. For each question, choose the correct answer. First, listen to the introduction and note the example question below. Hello everyone, I'm Lisa Q and thanks for tuning in to Radio Ride, the ideal program to listen to while you are on the road. Today, I have the pleasure of being at the 68th annual Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in Sturgis, South Dakota. Example. How often does the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally take place? The correct answer is A. Every year. It's a hot sunny day and there are thousands of motorcycle fanatics enjoying the festivities here. I'm here with Dave, a Sturgis native who has been attending this rally for over 50 years. Dave, tell us a bit about the rally. Hey, Lisa. Welcome to Sturgis. Well, the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally actually began with a small motorcycle race 68 years ago. Now it is a huge event that draws over 500,000 people to our small town for an entire week in August. Motorcycle fans from all over the country come for the breathtaking rides through the beautiful Black Hills of South Dakota. But there are also concerts, bike shows, and races that keep the guests occupied. I bought my first motorcycle at the 1950 rally and have been coming ever since. And as long as I'm able to ride, I will keep coming, that's for sure. 
one. Where is Dave from? Two. Where do people attending the motorcycle rally come from? Three. How long has Dave been coming to the rally? Well, it definitely seems like an exciting place to be, especially if you like motorcycles. The rally lasts an entire week. What kind of events take place during the week? And also, where do all these visitors stay? Well, every day there are organized rides around the Sturges area. Groups of riders head out to the Black Hills, like I mentioned before, and also into the Badlands National Park. These are day rides which usually begin at around 9 a.m., and end around 6 or 7 p.m. Also, there are stunt shows with professional riders, racers, motorcycle exhibits showing the latest and newest models, and customized motorcycle stands. But don't worry, there are plenty of concerts and fashion shows to entertain even the non-riders. As for where to stay, most riders choose to camp. The city park used to be open to visitors, and that's where most people chose to camp in the early days. However, when they decided to close City Park, campgrounds started springing up in and around Sturgis. Now there are enough to accommodate hundreds of thousands of visitors. However, there are also plenty of motels in the area for those that prefer a more comfortable place. 4. How long does the rally last? are rides organized during the rally? Six, what events take place during the rally that may interest non-riders? Seven, where do most riders stay? Well, thanks, Dave. You really are a rally expert. Now, I'm moving on to what seems to be a pretty popular stand here at the rally, Bob's Custom Bikes. Hello, Bob. I'm Lisa, and you're live on Radio Ride. Tell us a bit about yourself and your stand here at the Sturgis Rally. Hello, Lisa. Well, I first attended the Sturgis Rally as a motorcycle rider about five years ago. I fell in love with the rides through the Black Hills, and even raced in a couple of races. But my true passion was for customizing bikes, beginning with my own. I practically took my first motorcycle apart and added new parts and painted it, turning it into what I consider a work of art. Then I decided to open up a shop and do what I love doing for other people. Now I come every year to the Sturgis Rally to show off and sell my work. You'd be amazed at how popular it has become to customize your bike. Adding something special to your bike makes it stand out. It could be just painting a design on the body or completely making it over by changing the handlebars, the wheels, the seat, etc. These bikes that I have here on display are all bikes I have designed and customized myself. About 10 of them are mine. I don't ride all of them though. Some I just feel are beautiful to look at. The rest of the bikes, the ones with the red stickers on them, are bikes that I have customized and are for sale. Eight. What did Bob do when he first attended the rally? Nine. 
nine. How many races has Bob taken part in? Ten. What did Bob do to his first motorcycle? Eleven. Which bikes at Bob's stand are for sale? Wow, you are a true artist, Bob. Best of luck to you. Now, I would like to hear from some riders. I see a woman on a bike getting ready to start her engine. She is surrounded by a group of women motorcyclists. Hello, ma'am. You're live on Radio Ride. Can you tell me a bit about yourself and why you come to the Sturgis Rally? Well, of course. My name is Elizabeth Jones, and I've been coming to the Sturgis Rally for about 10 years now. I first came with a friend of mine and completely fell in love with the area and the rally itself. One ride through the Black Hills was all I needed to see why so many riders come to Sturgis. I knew I had to come again, but with my own motorcycle. So, I bought my first motorcycle and came the following year with two of my girlfriends. 12. Who is Elizabeth Jones? Thirteen. When did Elizabeth first attend the rally with her own motorcycle? Elizabeth, people don't really associate women with the world of motorcycles and races. Tell me, what attracts you and your girlfriends to the rally? Well, all that is changing. Today, there are a lot of women who ride motorcycles, and the Sturgis Rally is one of the biggest events. There is so much to do here. I've entered a few races, and even came in fourth place a couple of years ago. I come every year with a group of my girlfriends, who all ride motorcycles. We call ourselves the Joy Riders. We ride every day and return and enjoy the festivities. I don't race anymore, but a couple of girls in our group do, and one of them, Sarah Parker, actually performs motorcycle stunts here at the Sturgis Rally every year. 14. Who still takes part in races? Fifteen. What does Sarah Parker do at the rally? I've heard that most of the people attending the rally stay at campsites. Since you have been coming here for so many years, you should have some good advice about where the best place to stay is. Well, yeah. There are so many different kinds of lodging available. Hotels, cabins, campsites, you name it. The first couple of times I came, I stayed at one of the motels, which wasn't bad because you have all your comforts. But the truth is that it's much more fun at a campsite. So much is happening around you, and you get to meet so many interesting people from all over the country. The campsite we stay at is only a few minutes from the Sturgis Main Street, and there is live entertainment every day. There's a mechanic on site, a laundromat where you can wash your clothes, and most important of all, lots of shade. You know, South Dakota can get pretty hot and dry in summer. 16. Where did Elizabeth stay the first time she went to the rally?
17. According to Elizabeth, what is the main reason she likes the place she stays at? Thanks for talking to us, Elizabeth, and good luck to all the Joyriders. Now, I've also heard that here at Sturgis, you can join the Mayor of Sturgis in the Mayor's Ride and even leave your own personalized message on a street of bricks on Main Street. Here to tell us a bit more is John Moser, a Sturgis native who works at the information booth here at the rally. Hello, John. Can you tell us a bit more about these two events? Hello, Lisa. Well... There are a few things that make the Sturgis Rally unique. Uh, first of all, what you said is true. You can actually join the mayor of Sturgis on a ride to Mount Rushmore and Custard State Park, which are both south of the town. Uh, this will be the sixth annual mayor's ride. Participants must first register and pay a fee of $160, and only 250 riders will be allowed to enter. For five years now, these rides have been full, and there have been complaints about limiting the number of riders. So we are thinking of expanding the number in the future. The good thing is that all the profits from this ride go to the Sturgis Fire Department. Visitors to the rally can also commemorate their visit in stone by purchasing a brick on Main Street. You can simply choose to write your name and the date, or a simple message. But it's a great way of preserving your participation here at the rally for future generations. Each brick costs $75. Here, let me give you one. You don't have to pay. It's a gift from me. Thank you, John, and thanks for talking to us, too. 18. How much does it cost to take part in the mayor's ride? Nineteen. Where does the money from the mayor's ride go? What is true about the commemorative bricks? Module 2. Roundup. A. You will hear five different people talking about a mysterious event or experience. Choose from the list A to F the statement that best describes each speaker's experience. Use the letters only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. Speaker 1. People think that science can explain everything. I used to believe that too. But I have changed my opinion after what happened when I was swimming and diving off the coast of Australia. Perhaps that was a mistake, as I knew there were sharks in the area. Suddenly, I hit my leg on a coral reef and there was a lot of blood. I saw two sharks coming, but lost consciousness. I could have died. But instead, I woke up when something seemed to pull me out of the water and carry me to the beach. What could it have been? I am alive, but I don't know how or why. Speaker 2 The thing that really surprised me was the size of the stones or columns. Not only are they very tall and heavy, but they look like they were cut from the same rock or mountain. I mean, they are not stuck together like we do today with bricks. And where do they come from? 
I couldn't see any mountains near Stonehenge. And what was it? Did people live inside it? I don't think they did, and archaeologists haven't discovered any other homes nearby. Speaker 3 Hasn't this building and the whole surrounding area belonged to the British royal family for over 700 years? Haven't they always controlled who goes in and out of the Tower of London? So they must know who took the two young princes. They should let the police investigate the details. The people have a right to know the truth. Nobody can possibly believe that the boys just ran away to escape from their cruel stepmother. Speaker 4 It was a lovely sunset that night, and I decided to take the Labradors for a walk over the hill. Suddenly, I heard a noise and I looked down the valley and saw a stagecoach. When I got a better look, I saw soldiers with flashing guns and Native American Indians on horses. It was a scene right out of a western. Look, I know this sounds ridiculous, but it was so real. They weren't shooting a film or something. I've even got a photo on my mobile phone, but everyone thinks it's a trick photo. Speaker 5 It was just like that Mel Gibson film, Signs. I mean, the one about crop circles. Of course, I don't believe that there are airports for aliens or advertising logos for galaxy-wide companies. But what are they? I have lived here all my life, and I'm not crazy. I am sorry. But those crop circles just weren't there yesterday. And I didn't hear anyone drive up here in the middle of the night to do anything. I just don't understand. And it's a bit scary. What's next? That's what I'm worried about. B. You will hear a radio interview with a chief inspector talking about a funny crime story. For questions 1 to 10, complete the sentences. Good afternoon everyone, I am Jennifer Smith and welcome once again to our weekly radio programme which brings you strange but true crime stories from around the world. Today we are here with Chief Inspector Steve Robinson from Scotland Yard. Welcome Chief Inspector Robinson, how are you today? Thank you for having me Jennifer, I am fine. And you? I am great, thank you. I understand you have quite an unusual story to tell us today. I am sure our listeners will really enjoy it. Yes, Jennifer, this is quite an interesting story. One that actually made all of us at Scotland Yard laugh out loud. Wow, that sounds really worth hearing. Tell us more about it. Early on the morning of the 28th of March, we got a frantic call from R.J. Holder, the manager of a Mercedes-Benz showroom. He told us that he had gone to the delivery yard located at the rear of the showroom to prepare for delivery of engine parts. When he returned to the showroom, he was astonished to find that he had been robbed of five luxury cars and that the front door was unlocked. My goodness, that is a lot of vehicles. It must have been an inside job. Initially, that is what we thought, and we sent a couple of detectives to the showroom. As they began their investigation, they found there was no sign of forced entry. All they found was the unlocked door with the keys on the inside and a trail of chewing gum wrappers leading away from the front entrance. How strange. Where did it lead? The officers followed the trail to an abandoned warehouse about one mile away from the showroom. One mile? That is quite a distance. Guess it was lucky that it wasn't windy that morning. 
Actually, what happened was whoever was chewing the gum used the wrappers to dispose of their already chewed gum, and that weighed them down. That's why they didn't blow away. My goodness, that is quite lucky. So what did your detectives find at the warehouse? When the detectives entered the warehouse, they were greeted by a security guard who was chewing gum. The detectives began questioning the security guard, at which point he took out a piece of chewing gum with the exact same wrapper as the ones the detectives had found earlier. It seems the thief fell right into your hands. Yes, it was our lucky day. But the story gets even more interesting. When we took him back to Scotland Yard to get a warrant to search the rest of the warehouse and to question him, he confessed to everything. What did he say? He told us that he and five of his friends had visited the showroom on the afternoon of the 27th of March, pretending to be customers, and that they proceeded to hide in the boots of the five vehicles, while the sixth member caused a distraction by pretending to have a heart attack. That is fascinating. But how did they get out of the showroom? They waited until the showroom closed, then made their way around finding the keys to each vehicle. When Mr. Holder opened the showroom the next morning, he left the keys on his desk and went to the delivery yard to prepare for the delivery. The thieves took the keys, opened the front showroom door, put the vehicles into neutral and quietly pushed them out into the street. Then they started the engines and made their way to the warehouse. But what were the chewing gum wrappers all about? That is the funniest part. It seems that the security guard was trying to give up smoking and had taken up chewing gum instead. His anxiety about the robbery caused him to go through ten packets, which led us right to the warehouse. So would they have got away if it hadn't been for the wrappers? Most likely. They had a well-thought-out plan. They had a cargo ship waiting at the port so they could transport the cars to Barcelona in the afternoon. If they had managed to do so, it would have been very difficult for us to catch them. Thank you for that great story. I'm sure we all had a laugh. Thank you for having me. I wish you continued success in your program. I hope everyone enjoyed our program this week. We will be back on the air next week, same time, with another strange but true crime story. Have a great day. Copyright MM Publications 2009 CD 2 Unit 5 You will hear short conversations. After you hear each conversation, you will be asked a question about what you heard. Choose the picture which answers the question correctly. It must have been fun growing up on a farm. It wasn't all fun and games. There was a lot of work to do. Really? Like using a tractor to plow a field? Actually, my dad always did that. I took care of the animals. I fed the chickens and cows. What did the man's father do on the farm? cutting on the weekends. Me too. I've been collecting antiques for over 20 years. Let me guess. You collect silver candlesticks. No, antique furniture. Although lately I've had my eye on this beautiful grandfather clock. What is the woman thinking of buying? to live in. We'd like to try the desert. Are you crazy? What about somewhere in the mountains next to a big lake? Maybe. I like the sound of that, actually. I still don't know why you'd want to leave the city. Seattle is such a great place to live in. Where does the woman live now?
Four. How's the new job going? Oh, same old thing, different day. If you work at one office, you've worked at them all. I see. So you still spend most of your time in front of the computer, huh? If I'm not there, I'm in meetings all day. At least I don't have to battle fax machines anymore. What doesn't the man do at work? Of a little spider. I'm terrified of them. And you shouldn't make fun of me, Mr. I can't look at snakes. That's not the same at all. Snakes are much scarier, worse than rats, even. What is the man most afraid of? Six. So, uh, what are you going to wear tonight? You know you can't get away with jeans. It's a formal dinner. Oh, I know, and I hate wearing dresses. You could just wear a skirt or something. Yeah, I guess I have no choice. What is the woman going to wear tonight? was definitely the best thing in the amusement park. Actually, I like the games more than anything else. I'm not much for carnival rides. Not even the Ferris wheel? Nah, not really. What was the man's favorite thing at the amusement park? August 13th. Oh, that's right. She said her baby was born the day before her own birthday. Right. And I definitely know that hers is on the 14th. When was the baby born? Nine. I'm really hungry right now. I only had cereal for breakfast. I don't know how you can last all day on so little. I have to at least have some pancakes. I can't stand pancakes. I guess I could try some bacon and eggs. That would certainly be better than just plain cereal. What does the woman usually have for breakfast? To this aquarium. I've never seen so many exotic fish and marine animals before. Tell me about it. My favorite was the jellyfish exhibit. Yeah, it's just too bad the shark exhibit was closed. What didn't they see at the aquarium? is next to a restaurant. It is, but it's a Mexican restaurant, not an Italian one. Ah, and there's a bookstore on the other side of your house, right? There used to be. Now there's a music store. Where's the woman's house? here. Still, it's nowhere near as bad as the water. Oh, come on. Some trash in the lake is nothing compared to the car and factory smoke all over. It's much worse. We can't drink the water or use it for cooking. It's so polluted. Which kind of pollution does the woman think is the worst?
Unit 6. You will hear a radio interview with a spokesperson of a company called Endangered Species Chocolates. For questions 1 to 7, choose the best answer, A, B or C. It's safe to say that almost everyone loves chocolate, especially really good chocolate. And a flourishing company is taking advantage of that, using the worldwide demand for chocolate to spread positive environmental messages. They have been able to do this by starting a collection of high-quality, all-natural, fairly traded chocolate. Sarah Moore is a spokesperson for Endangered Species Chocolates, who is here today to tell us more about the products and the positive effects they are having on the environment. Chocolate is one of the most loved and most consumed foods the world over, without exception. However, like all other products, it can have either positive or negative effects on the environment and the people that eat it. That is why we provide extremely delicious chocolates made with only the finest 100% natural ingredients. Furthermore, all of our products are wrapped in appealing packaging that emphasizes the importance of the Earth's creatures and their need for our protection. How did you come up with the idea of chocolate as a way of informing people about endangered species? Like we said before, just about everybody loves chocolate. So what better way to get an important message across than to put it on the one thing everyone loves to eat? It just wouldn't have the same impact with broccoli or carrots. So we took advantage of the consumer's sweet tooth to educate and inspire them. That is a great way to get the message out there. When did you come up with this great idea? Endangered Species Chocolate, ESC, was founded in 1993 in an effort to spread awareness and to make a positive impact on the growing number of plants and animal species that are disappearing from the planet. We decided that 10% of the company's net profits should be donated to help support endangered species their habitats, and therefore humanity. And how is the business going? Great! In 2005, we decided to move from our original facility in Oregon to a new factory in Indiana. We had to do that in order to keep up with the growing demand for premium chocolate with a cause and to take advantage of a centralized location to reduce shipping costs and time. Our new factory is LEED certified and we are busier than ever. Could you explain what LEED means for us common folk? LEED is a rating system that certifies that the building is environmentally responsible. The certification is strictly monitored, and so we have to constantly keep up our responsibility. That is great. But now, on to the good stuff. Why don't you tell us about the chocolate? We make three-ounce bars named after different endangered animals. For instance, there is the sea turtle bar, made with dark chocolate and blueberries and the Wolf Bar, made with dark chocolate, dried cranberries and almonds. We also have amazing milk chocolate like the Dolphin Bar, made with dried cherries and the Giraffe Bar, made with peanut butter. If you're a white chocolate fan, you should buy the Polar Bear Bar, made with macadamia nuts. For something different, try the Eco Rounds. Which one is your favourite? I really like the Giraffe Bar because I'm a huge fan of peanut butter. And I also have the purse to match it. I'm sorry, what? Oh, I forgot to mention that we also make purses out of the wrappers that are either damaged or have misprints on them. We are trying to combine style and social responsibility, and our products spread a message of fashionable ecology. The folded and woven items are handmade by artisans in Mexico and Peru. That is wonderful. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Thank you.
Module 3, Roundup. You will hear short conversations. After you hear each conversation, you will be asked a question about what you heard. Choose the picture which answers the question correctly. 1. I heard you got a kitten. I bet you love having her around. Oh yeah, we play together all the time. It's great. She has this little ball that she loves. Is it the kind that you hold in front of her? No, it stands on its own and she hits it. She's crazy about that thing. What is the cat's favorite toy? Two. What are you doing this weekend? Want to catch a movie or something? I'd love to, but I can't. I just started a new class on Saturdays. Oh, that's right. You were telling me about that. What is it called? Art history? How do you like it? That class was full, so I decided to take a photography class instead. What class was the woman going to take? Jim go. Awful. The personal trainer was so demanding. First, he made me use the exercise bike for an hour, and I swear that my legs were about to fall off. I thought they were supposed to take it slow on the first day. So did I. I thought it couldn't get any worse, but then he took me into the weight room. That is when I thought I wouldn't leave the building alive. Wow, that sounds awful. No, it gets worse. I locked my keys in the car and had to walk three kilometers home to get the spare keys and then three kilometers back. Every part of my body hurts. What did he not do at the gym? Four. Did you see how that passenger reacted when we had that terrible turbulence? Do you mean the one who got sick? I mean the one who remained totally calm, and I thought he was already dead. Oh yeah, that guy in front of the old man who was screaming for ten minutes or so. Which of the passengers is she talking about? is too bad. I think garlic is great in everything. What ingredient did the woman not use? Six. Where were you last night when I called? It sounded like you were at the opera. No, there was a local band playing at the park yesterday. And my sister and I went to check them out. But I could have sworn I heard an orchestra. When you called, we were walking back to the car, and there was a marching band practicing in the parking lot. What did the man go see? Seven. We have so much housework to do. I think you need to get started on the dishes. Okay, I'll do it after I mop the floor. But what are you going to do? I'm going to vacuum. Oh, that's not exactly fair now, is it? Which chore is she going to do first? a pie baking contest. How did it go? Oh, hi, John. It was okay. I won first prize, but it was nothing special. 
I was hoping they wouldn't give me one of those horrible ribbons, but that's exactly what they did. At least you didn't get those medals they give to the runners-up. Yeah, I guess you are right, but I would definitely go for a silver cup. What did she win? Unit 7. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions 1 to 8, choose the best answer, A, B or C. 1. You hear a film director talking about his films. What does he say about the special effects? A. They create great art. B. They are made on computers. C. They are not expensive to make. As the director of the film, I accept that it is my responsibility to make it as entertaining as possible. To be absolutely honest, I am not interested in great art. I want my films to be remembered because there's so much action in them. And that means gunshots, car chases, and of course, special effects. I know that special effects are expensive, but I think that they are definitely worth it. In the past, we used stuntmen, but nowadays we do all the special effects on computers in our own studio. Two, you overhear a conversation in the lobby of a theater. What did the woman think of the musical? A, she thought it was extremely funny. B, she enjoyed the dancing. C. The songs were the best part of the performance. What a performance! I'm really glad we went to see it. It was a great musical, and I don't think I've laughed so much for years. Yes, I think that everyone in the audience heard you laughing, but it wasn't a comedy. I think that the dancers were very creative and had lots of energy. But the songs, even though I know that it was just an amateur performance, I have to say that, in my opinion, they were absolutely ridiculous. Three. You hear part of a radio interview. Who is answering the questions? A. A car mechanic. B. The driver of one of the cars. C. A firefighter. What was it like when you arrived? Well, it wasn't very nice. Someone had called my breakdown service to say that a car was blocking the main road. But as I got there, the car exploded into flames. What happened next? All the other car drivers got out of their cars and ran away. Fortunately, the firefighters were on the scene in minutes. Four. You hear a man talking about how he became famous. Why did he decide to take part in the reality show? A. To make some money. B. To make new friends. C. To become famous. you take part in the reality show? I could say that I thought it would be a good chance to meet new people, but the truth is that I had just graduated from university and didn't have a job. I was going to do some travelling, but when I saw the advert for the show, I decided that it was a chance to get some money. Is that what happened? Did you win lots of money? Not really, but I did become famous. Five. You will hear a woman talking about a book reading by a Nobel Prize winner. What did she particularly like about the reading? A. The extract from the novel. B. The scientific facts. C. The fact that it was very funny. It was the first time. 
time that I had ever seen a famous author face to face, and it was a special moment for me. After explaining some scientific facts about climate change, he read the part of his new novel, which is a description of why the main character had so many problems with his family and community in the Amazonian rainforest. I much preferred the second part of his talk, but was surprised that most of my friends complained that he didn't make any jokes. I told them that they should have gone to see a comedy act. Six. You overhear a celebrity chef talking to his agent on the phone. What suggestion does the agent make? A. The chef should improve the food. B. Viewers should be invited into the kitchen. C. The camera should concentrate more on the chef. Look, we all know that you are a wonderful chef, but the viewers want to see you too, not just the food. After all, we have to think about the ratings for the show, so we must be careful not to make the food look so delicious that half the viewers turn off the program and rush into the kitchen. Okay, I understand what you are saying, and I have been thinking the same thing myself. I will tell the director to let me talk more. We can get the camera to zoom in on me and keep the food a bit more to the side. Seven. You overhear two friends discussing a music video. What does the man say about the singer's clothes? A. He thinks they weren't suitable. B. He says that they were very colourful. C. He thinks they cost too much money. I thought the background shots of the desert were amazing. So did I. The cactus flowers were so colourful. And her dress must have been made of silk. And the boots were satin. But who would wear such things in the heat and the dust of a desert? Don't you think that the director made a mistake about that? It's pity because it must have taken a lot of time and cost a lot of money to make the music video in that location. Eight. You overhear a supermodel talking about an experience she had on a Caribbean island. What has upset her? A. The weather. B. Losing some jewellery. C. The money she earned. I still haven't recovered. There was a terrible fuss with the agency and for a long time I thought I would have to give them all the money that I earned for the shoot. Oh dear. What happened? Well, it was extremely hot. And at the end of a long and difficult fashion shoot, I just jumped into the sea. What's wrong with that, Chloe? I forgot I was still wearing the pearl earrings, and we lost one very, very expensive earring. Unit 8. You are going to hear a radio program about the Sundance Film Festival. You will hear the program in several parts. After each part, you will hear some questions. For each question, choose the correct answer. First, listen to the introduction and note the example question below. This is Andrea Summers and we are broadcasting live on WNB from the world famous Sundance Film Festival. With me to tell us a little about the origins of the festival is film critic Dan Bradley. Dan, when exactly did the Sundance Film Festival begin? Well, the festival as we know it today began in 1981 in Park City, Utah. It actually developed out of the Utah U.S. Film Festival, which Sterling Van Wagenen and Robert Redford had founded several years previously in order to attract filmmakers to the state of Utah and promote the production of independent filmmaking. Example. When was the Utah U.S. Film Festival founded? The correct answer is B. I'm pretending.
particularly interested in learning about what the Sundance Institute has to do with the film festival. Tell us a little about that. Well, the Sundance Institute is a nonprofit organization that was established in 1980 in order to discover and encourage independent artists such as directors, screenwriters, composers, playwrights, and theater artists. Its aim is to support and inspire these artists and help audiences discover them too. The Institute has a number of projects and initiatives. The Sundance Film Festival is one of them. The film festival became a part of the Institute in 1985 with the help of founder Robert Redford. This is also when the festival started adding international films to its programming. That's very interesting. Now, Dan, the Sundance Film Festival is a major event in the film industry worldwide. Could you tell us what has led to its great success? Certainly. Over the years, the festival has grown from a modest, low-budget event to one which now attracts major studio directors, Hollywood celebrities, an abundance of media attention, and of course, paparazzi. Several things have contributed to this growth. For one, the fact that Robert Redford is a resident of Utah, where the festival takes place, definitely creates a lot of publicity and attention. Another important factor is the venue. Having the festival at a ski resort in winter definitely adds to the attraction of it. Actually, did you know that Sidney Pollack, the famous Hollywood director, suggested that the festival be moved from September to January? He made this suggestion because having the festival at a ski resort in the winter would draw more people, especially from Hollywood. Now it's held at the Sundance Ski Resort. One. Whose work does the Sundance Film Festival promote? Two, how long has the festival included international films? Sundance Film Festival take place in January? How does the Sundance Institute feel about the way the festival has developed? That's a good question. In 2007, they started a campaign to distance the festival from all the media frenzy and paparazzi. They handed out buttons to independent filmmakers, reminding them to focus on film and not be influenced by all the publicity and commercialism. You know, some of the sponsoring companies had actually started handing out gifts to those who attended the festival, and independent marketing operations have been set up during the festival. This blatant behavior goes against the whole idea of what the festival stands for. Though it's not illegal per se, it's still not something we want to encourage. 4. What does the motto, Focus on Film, mean? commercialization of the festival. Thank you very much for your time, Dan. Now let's turn to Ed Howard, a member of the festival's programming committee. Ed, tell us, what exactly does the programming committee do? Andrea? Our job is to review thousands of independent films in order to find that special talent that we are looking for. What we are particularly interested in is independence of thought, as well as creative risk-taking in the development of ideas, films that are in some ways revolutionary or thought-provoking. We see films of all kinds, from all over the world, in almost every language known to man. In fact, we even started doing an online short film contest. And during the festival, we constantly stream the shorts through our website, www.sundance.org 
backslash festival. It's great exposure for people who make short films, especially film students. Six. What is the main criterion for a film to be chosen for the festival? Seven. What kind of films are shown on the Sundance website? come to the festival with high hopes of gaining recognition and establishing a name for themselves. That's true. As a matter of fact, some of the most famous independent filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino and Kevin Smith got their lucky break here at Sundance. After Reservoir Dogs in 1992 and Clerks in 1994, the world was introduced to the greatness of Tarantino and Smith. Both of these films were groundbreaking in their categories and really put the idea of independent filmmaking on the map. After these two movies, we saw an increase in the creation of low-budget independent films. That's very lucky for us. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to have you explain to our listeners just how the festival got its name. Of course. The festival was named after the Sundance Kid. That was Robert Redford's character in the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I hope that satisfies your listeners' curiosity. Eight. What happened when movies like Reservoir Dogs and Clerks were shown? Nine. Where did the name of the festival come from? a little more about the Sundance Institute and its role in the festival. The Institute supports independent artists in several ways. First, it supports nonfiction by providing year-long financial support from its documentary fund, which encourages creative independent documentary filmmakers to promote and exhibit their work. Other forms of support offered by the Sundance Institute include screenwriter and filmmaker labs, advice about creativity, and financial support. Finally, the Sundance Film Music Program helps emerging composers and advises them how they can influence independent filmmakers. The Institute also houses a unique archive of independent music. 10. Apart from financial support, how else does the Sundance Film Festival support independent artists? Which group of professionals does the Institute organize labs for? That's excellent, Ed. So, if someone wants to help out at the festival behind the scenes, is this possible? Oh, sure. The Institute has a number of year-round staff positions that people can apply for if they are in the area or want to move here. However, volunteering during the festival itself is a very popular option. The Institute and the festival rely on the commitment and dedication of our volunteers, so we love all the applicants we can get. We have an incredibly diverse group of volunteers each year, and we absolutely do not discriminate in terms of gender, race, religion, or against those with disabilities. It's very easy to apply. You can download the application form from our website. Or if you have any questions, you can email us at institute at sundance.org. And even if you don't live nearby, don't worry. We still need volunteers all over the country and even on an international level to help promote the festival. We appreciate help and support in any form, whether it's donations, promotion, or just word of mouth attention. 12. What is true about the festival volunteers?
13. How can volunteers from abroad help to support the festival? Why do you think film festivals, in particular the Sundance Film Festival, are so important? Well, festivals are considered to be the lifeblood of the international filmmaking community. Without this opportunity for the independent films of the U.S. and other countries, they might not have been seen or, more importantly, they may not have been distributed or promoted at all. Do these independent films avoid the dangers of commercialism that affect certain parts of the film industry? Certainly. Festivals such as the Sundance Film Festival focus on films that possess great artistic and creative merits. Films that tend to focus on social issues, which may not always have been commercial successes, but are thought-provoking. These independent films share a common thread such as political, moral, or personal social themes. They tend to reflect the various problems existing in the world right now. Many describe personal solutions in order to survive and continue day after day. That's very interesting. Can you please give us your views on independent films which emphasize environmental and social issues? Well, independent filmmaking represents a persistent presence of a broad spectrum of ideas. We can see that the issues raised by these films are close to real-life events currently happening in our world. People are making changes in their lifestyles in order to protect the environment. Finally, I would like to add that we, the audience, will be surprised by how many of these independent films will end up being successful. The majority of them gain popularity because they tend to reflect our common concerns for a better world. 14. What makes festivals like the Sundance Film Festival so important? Fifteen. What do movies shown at the Sundance Film Festival usually emphasize? Sixteen. Why are many independent films so successful? Thank you, Ed. I'm sure there are many of our listeners out there who are fascinated by everything that goes on outside of the public eye. I am now speaking to Emily Sanders, a resident of Park City. Emily, tell us what it's like to live so close to such an esteemed event. Well, as you can imagine, it has its ups and downs. First, we are able to get our movie tickets earlier than the visitors, so it's very easy for us to see what we want. Oh, and of course, everyone loves the thrill of seeing a celebrity in your hometown, especially one you love. The unfortunate part is usually the fact that they are surrounded by hordes of paparazzi. It does bring a lot of business to our town, though, which I'm sure everyone appreciates. Now, Emily, you told me that you've lived here your whole life, so you've seen the festival from its humble beginnings. Can you describe what the town was like then with respect to the presence of the festival? And how is it different today? Park City was definitely a different place back in the 70s. The town was much smaller then and very quiet. Today there are about 8,000 permanent residents and that number grows during the festival. Back then we still had skiing as a popular pastime, but today it's grown into an actual business. I'm sure that Sundance had a hand in that. Now with all the attention from the festival, the tourism industry has really taken off. 17. What is the negative effect of having celebrities in Park City? 18. How has the population changed since the beginning of the festival? Other than the 
festival, what's the draw for the area? What can tourists do here? During the winter, the main activity is anything snow related. There are several popular resorts here, such as the canyons and the Park City Mountain Resort. Each one has different things to do like skiing and bobsledding, but you can also go tubing down a snow-covered hill. It's better than using a sled. The rest of the year, the resorts are still open and you can swim and do sports. Plus, we have a very active nightlife as well as lots of culturally related places to visit. There are museums, the theater, and concert halls. Oh, but the best thing about our town is definitely the natural scenery. I mean, look around. It's stunning here. We have all these beautiful mountains with parks and things to explore. You never run out of things to do here, even in the off season. That sounds nice, Emily. We really appreciate your talking to us. It certainly sounds like you've seen your fair share of changes around here. That's all the time we have today, listeners. Make sure to see as many of the Sundance Film Festival entries as you can. I know I will. 19. When are the resorts open? What does Emily believe is the greatest attraction of the town? 16-year-olds Marcus Griffin and Megan Wright are the winners of this year's Talented Britain Award for Best New Graffiti Artists. Welcome. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. So why don't you two begin by telling us about how you got started? Marcus and I have been best friends since nursery school. He's a brother to me, and we have both always loved drawing. Yeah. Even when it was just our crayon drawings, we realised that we had the same passion for art. And we were the only kids in our nursery school that drew our own pictures. The others just coloured in colouring books. Wow. But you have come a long way from crayon drawings. How did you get started on your current projects? Well, it all started in secondary school. We were sitting outside one afternoon, just after lessons had finished. And we realised that we were tired of seeing the bare walls. So we went to the nearest hardware store and picked up a few tins of spray paint. Went back to the school and began painting graffiti murals. As we were finishing up for the day, two police officers happened to be walking by. They called the headmaster of the school and our parents, and we were about to be charged with vandalism. But when the headmaster saw our work, he loved it and refused to press charges. He even asked us to paint the remaining walls. And the day that we finished the last wall, he surprised us by calling the local TV station, and they aired our story. We were both surprised and a little embarrassed too. That is incredible. What happened after that? Well, after all the publicity, the rest of the schools in our area contacted us to paint over their walls. But doesn't it take time away from your schoolwork? No, because we do it on our own time, before or after lessons, even at the weekend. Of course, only after we have completed our schoolwork. It actually motivates us to finish it sooner, because we want to get it done and go out to paint. I have heard you're so good that you actually get paid for the work you're doing. 
that must be exciting. We are not exactly being paid. Our school has opened up a bank account for each of us, but we can't withdraw the money until we're 18 years old. It is nice to know that there's something saved up for the future, though. It also gave our parents a sense of relief. Congratulations. What about the Talented Britain Award? How did you manage to get nominated for that? Did your parents nominate you? Actually, it was our headmaster who had the idea after we appeared on TV. He was really impressed with our work and thought we deserved more recognition. Winning the award was a real shock. We were up against some very talented people that have been around a long time. It was an honour, and the prize wasn't bad either. You mean the £5,000? Yes, but our parents only allowed us to keep £500 each. The rest they deposited into our bank accounts. Well, best of luck to you, and I wish you both continued success. Thank you. Published in copyright, MM Publications, 2009. CD3. Unit 9. You are going to hear a radio program about an annual cheese festival. You will hear the program in several parts. After each part, you will hear two to four questions. For each question, choose the correct answer. First, Listen to the introduction and note the example question below. Good morning, this is Erica Smith on WJOK, broadcasting live today from the kickoff of the annual Great Wisconsin Cheese Festival here in Little Shoot. Here with us is Dan Gill, mayor of Little Shoot, to tell us a little more about the town and the festivities. Dan? It's lovely to have you with us, Erica. Why don't you start off by giving us a brief introduction to Little Shoot? I would love to, Erica. We're a little town with a big heart here in Outagamie County, Wisconsin. John de Pomacen from the Netherlands founded this town in 1836, and the first non-Native American settlers who came in 1848 were mostly immigrants from the Netherlands. Example. When was Little Shoot founded? The correct answer is A. How about the name of your town? It is a little strange. Where does it come from? Well, the name is partially translated into English from the original French name, La Petite Chute, Little Falls, because of the fast-moving waters of the nearby Fox River. In the past, the Fox River waterway to the Mississippi River system was one of the most heavily traveled routes between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. So, many people have traveled through our town. 1. What does Dan say about the name of the town? nearby river. Three. What is true about the Fox River? interesting. What's the town like today? Well, today Little Shoot has a population of about 11,000 people, and we are a very prosperous little town. We have begun a project for tourism development. We have already started construction of a full-scale working windmill, which will serve as a museum and a tourist attraction. And you might like to know that we have many festivals just like this one throughout the year that attract tourists from all over the country. Four, what have the people of Little Shoot started building? Five, 
five. What does Dan say about Little Shoot? Great. What can you tell us about the Cheese Festival? Well, the best person to talk to about the festival is Sandra Dawes, our events coordinator. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Erica. I hope you are enjoying your time with us. To get to your question, the annual Great Wisconsin Cheese Festival is our most popular festival. It brings in people from all over the country. There is some disagreement as to when the Cheese Festival started. Some say that it began in 1920, and others say that it officially became known as the Cheese Festival in 1981. But the earliest record of it is from 1914, when the locals thought they would take advantage of the fact that this area is the dairy capital of America. Of course, we have come a long way since then. But the same values remain. Friendship built through sharing experiences and pride in our heritage. Six, when does the cheese festival date back to? Seven, what is the Little Shoot area famous for? some of the events? Well, we encourage members of the public to enter into the spirit of things by getting them to participate in a range of bizarre yet amusing activities. The cheese carving contest is a favorite among the local chefs and artists as they compete to carve 40 pound blocks of mild cheddar into objects of beauty. Some of our past festival entries have included themes like farmhouses, corporate logos, and even a cow. But I think the all-time favorite is the cheesecake competition. We usually have 50 to 100 entries per year, and people always volunteer like crazy to be judges. I know that everyone loves it when the top three cheesecakes have been chosen, and then all the cheesecakes get cut up and sold for a dollar a slice. Eight. What do the event coordinators encourage the public to do? done with the cheese in the carving contest. Ten. What is the most popular part of the festival? after the top three cheesecakes are chosen. Have you ever had any strange entries? All the time. We have had lime jello cheesecakes, apple pie cheesecakes, tomato and cherry cheesecake. Sometimes people submit entries that don't even look or taste anything like cheesecake. And of course, we have to turn them down. But the entry is tasted first before a decision is made, so we don't judge a book just by its cover. I must say that the all-time strangest entry we ever had was the blue cheese cheesecake entry a couple years back. And the most surprising thing was that it tasted great and actually won first prize. 12. What happens when people enter items that aren't cheesecake?
14. What was most surprising about the strangest entry? try to do in the cheese curd eating contest. shaped hat that Green Bay Packers fans made famous. It is a symbol of loyalty and support for the team, and it has over the years become a symbol for the cheese festival here. And not to boast or anything, but I am the most dedicated cheese head of all. Why do you say that? Well, a couple of years back, I was on a bus returning from a Packers away game, and we had an accident. I could have been killed, but miraculously, I wasn't seriously injured because my cheese head cushioned the blow. Now I work for the company that makes the hats, and I promote them everywhere I go. That is really an interesting story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Well, now I am off to buy myself one of the cheese head hats and enjoy the delicious cheesy treats. 19. What is a cheese head? Why is Don the most dedicated cheese head of all? Unit 10. You will hear part of a talk in which an expert is talking about body language. Listen and complete the sentences 1 to 10.
It's important to realize that communication is not limited to verbal exchanges. When we speak to each other, we convey a number of messages using our bodies, facial expressions, and tone of voice. Non-verbal communication or body language can give us an indication of what people are really thinking or feeling by either reinforcing or contradicting what is being said. But body language can be misinterpreted. So I would urge listeners not to jump to conclusions when assessing other people's physical signals. Probably the best way to convey to others what we are feeling is with our faces. Often words aren't even needed when one look or facial expression will do the trick. For example, when we want to show happiness, we smile and our eyes sparkle. When we are surprised, we widen our eyes and our jaws drop open. When we are afraid, our upper eyelids rise, making the whites of the eyes more visible, and our lips become tense. These facial expressions are common to people from all cultural backgrounds, but one should keep in mind the fact that some types of facial expressions differ from country to country. In North America, for example, people blush to show embarrassment. In Japan, embarrassment is shown by laughter or giggling. I'm sure you've heard the expression, the eyes are the window to the soul. There is great truth to this, because our eyes very clearly communicate what we are thinking and feeling. Eye contact is a particularly important element of face-to-face -face communication. If you want to form a bond with someone, it's vital that you maintain eye contact for at least 60 to 70% of the conversation. According to some studies, when Westerners talk to each other, they make eye contact about 61% of the time, and the average gaze lasts about 2.95 seconds. Remember, though, that in some Asian and South American countries, making eye contact for an extended period of time is frowned upon, because it can make the individual seem rude or hostile. Sometimes people avoid or break eye contact. There are many possible reasons for this. The person might be feeling embarrassed, ashamed or guilty, or he might be feeling uncomfortable in the presence of the individual he is talking to. Avoidance of eye contact might also be a sign that the person is feeling nervous and wants to avoid a confrontation. Posture is another important indicator of a person's mood or attitude. For example, positive, happy people tend to carry themselves upright while people who may be sad or bored will often slouch or collapse into their bodies. Another interesting point is that people who are fond of each other often lean in towards each other when engaged in conversation. Of course, it's not just our faces and bodies that communicate our feelings to other people. Very often, we use objects, such as glasses or pens, to send a non-verbal message. For example, People who have been pressured into making a decision and want to play for time will take off their glasses, slowly wipe the lenses, and then put their glasses back on. Sometimes people use sunglasses to hide their eyes and therefore their feelings, and to create a distance between themselves and the person they are talking to. Objects can also be used to make us feel more safe and secure, and to relieve tension. When people feel nervous, they may click a pen or chew on a pencil. People who are anxious might play with their jewelry or fiddle with their clothing. Body language is indeed a fascinating aspect of human communication. It gives us greater insight into other people's thoughts, feelings and attitudes and ultimately makes the communication process richer and more rewarding. You will hear five different people talking about ways in which different civilizations communicated. Choose from the list A to F the statement that best describes each civilization. Use the letters only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use.
Speaker one. Cave paintings made thousands of years ago by prehistoric man were the first real attempt at visual communication. Early artists used four basic paint colors, black, white, red, and yellow, to depict various scenes, the subjects of which were usually animals. Experts believe that cave paintings were intended to pass on information to other tribes about the hunting environment. Cave paintings and rock drawings were also used to warn others of potential danger. An example of this is a rock drawing that was found near a steep path in New Mexico. The picture shows a mountain goat standing up while a man and a horse lie on the ground nearby. The drawing is intended to warn horse riders that the path is too steep for horses. Speaker 2 The world's first writing system was invented by the Sumerians in Mesopotamia in about 3500 BC. In order to keep accurate records of the number of agricultural and manufactured goods that they produced, the Sumerians drew pictures of these items on the surface of wet clay tablets. These pictures were usually of objects such as sheep, wheat or bread. Gradually the images evolved into a system of symbols called cuneiform. This writing system, which consisted of about 600 symbols, was used by the Sumerians to create all sorts of documents from contracts and tax receipts to sales records. Speaker 3 In ancient Egypt, the written system of communication was called hieroglyphics. This form of writing consisted of picture symbols which represented ideas and sounds. The Egyptians used hieroglyphics for religious purposes and to keep a record of the activities of the royals. Only specially trained individuals called scribes were allowed to use this writing system. At around the same time, the Egyptians developed hieratic writing, a system of writing which could be used for daily communication. This type of writing was a simplified version of hieroglyphics and was used for letters and for keeping records and accounts. In about AD 300, the Egyptians stopped using hieroglyphics and switched to a simpler alphabet. Speaker 4 In about 1500 BC, the Chinese developed the most advanced system of writing in the world. Written Chinese has no alphabet and is made up of about 50,000 symbols or characters. According to legend, Chinese characters were invented by a man named Zhang Jie, who spent years studying nature and developing symbols that represented the individual characteristics of various plants and animals. The average Chinese person can recognize about 5,000 frequently used characters, which is enough to be able to read a novel or a newspaper. To understand ancient Chinese documents, an individual would have to learn many more characters. Speaker 5 The many tribes that lived in North America hundreds of years ago all spoke different languages. In order to communicate successfully with each other, the Native Americans developed a sign language system which consisted of numerous gestures and movements. They also used smoke signals to send messages to each other. This involved covering a fire with blanket and removing it quickly to allow a puff of smoke to rise up into the air. Senders were able to control the size, shape and timing of the smoke. The puffs of smoke were visible from a great distance, but the messages that were sent were usually very simple and therefore quite limited. Module 5, Roundup. You will hear short conversations. After you hear each conversation, you will be asked a question about what you heard. Choose the picture which answers the question correctly. 1. You are coming to dinner tonight, aren't you? Sure. Can you remind me of the time? Is it at 7? No, it is at 8. 
Originally, we had planned it for six, but nobody could make it. What time is the dinner? Two. What are you doing this weekend? My family and I are celebrating Chinese New Year. It is special this year because it is the year of the rat, and I was born in the year of the rat. Really? I think I was born in the year of the rabbit. Anyway, how do you celebrate New Year? We put up paper lanterns throughout the house, and we have lots of delicious food and loud music. Then my father and I dress up in the dragon costume and do the dragon dance while our family enjoys dessert. Which animal represents the year she was born in? Are you coming to Rosa's birthday party next weekend? I'm not sure. Which day is it? Initially, she had planned it for Saturday, but her favorite band is playing that night, so she is having it on Sunday night. Aw, that's too bad. I don't think I can make it. I have to catch an early flight on Monday morning. Which day would suit the woman? Four. Here are the directions to Julie's house. I am not very good at reading maps. Can you help me? Sure, but it's really easy. You go east along Main Street towards Elm Street, and it's on the southeast corner of High Street and Main Street. But if you get to Elm Street, you have gone too far. Great, thank you. I will see you there. Where is Julie's house? My cousin's wedding yesterday. It was a complete disaster. Oh my goodness! Why? Apparently, the seamstress who made the dress made it an inch too long, and my poor cousin was tripping over her dress constantly. That's awful. She must have been devastated. That isn't even the worst part. When they arrived at the reception, she tripped over her gown, sending her bouquet flying through the air, and it landed on the cake, destroying it. What started the series of unfortunate events? Six. What a pretty banner. Where did you get it? My son made it for me, and my daughter bought me this pie. It tastes really good. Would you like a slice? I would love a slice. I feel sort of guilty because I only bought my mother this plant. I am sure she would much rather have a pie. What did her daughter buy her? Seven. Why are you green, white, and orange today? Is it a special celebration or something? It is St. Patrick's Day, and I am wearing the colors of the Irish flag. Why don't you come to the cafeteria at lunch? We are going to have little green cakes in the shape of four-leaf clovers, and the rest of the gang is going to be dressed as leprechauns. It'll be fun. Okay, but why are the cakes green and in the shape of four-leaf clovers? For good luck, silly. What do the colors she is wearing symbolize? forward to the end of school year party. So am I. It's on June 28th, right? I think it's June 29th. Let me check my calendar. Oh, you don't have to. We'll look at the bulletin board. It's on the last day of June. When is the party?
Unit 11. 2. You will hear part of a radio program in which an educational psychologist is interviewed about what characterizes a genius. For questions 1 to 10, complete the sentences. Good morning. Today we are continuing with our series on the mind and intelligence. In our studio here today we have Mary Simpson, an educational psychologist who will tell us something about the secrets of being a genius. Welcome Mary. Thank you. Well, for many years it has been said that a genius is born with special abilities and possesses high intelligence. For example, a genius is characterized by strong individuality, imagination and creativity, in addition to extreme intelligence. We apply the term genius to Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein, William Shakespeare and many more. Does a genius possess a superior talent in any specific field? Yes, certainly. Einstein, for instance, was a genius in physics and mathematics. Da Vinci was gifted in many areas such as art, engineering and philosophy, while Shakespeare was a genius in literature. How did Leonardo da Vinci enrich himself to develop greater intelligence? Isn't it estimated that his IQ was approximately 220 and that he possessed great skill and creativity? Yes, that is a fact. Leonardo himself stated that there were seven secrets that could help you to become a genius. Firstly, he said that one must have an incredible curiosity about one's surrounding world, as well as burning desire to discover and achieve. Secondly, he insisted that knowledge must be constantly tested through experiences. Thirdly, he stated that the senses need to be constantly sharpened, so that there can be an understanding of the true nature of things, and not just the outer appearance of things we observe. The fourth secret is that we must accept vagueness and trust unseen forces that can influence our lives. The fifth characteristic is that one must develop a balance between art and science in order to live a varied and interesting life. His sixth secret was that one must lead a healthy lifestyle because he felt health and fitness would boost mental power. So, should we be more aware of our diet in order to improve our IQs? Most definitely. If we eat healthily, we will boost our energy levels and our ability to think clearly and creatively. Remember that creativity is essential to being a genius. What was his final secret? He felt that all the phenomena in the world are connected in some way. That is, energy, laws, nature and so on. We know that a genius may come in many forms. Leonardo was artistic. What can you tell us about William Shakespeare? William Shakespeare was a true literary genius. He saw life as theatre and vice versa, and his works covered a huge range of feelings and emotions. How fascinating. Are there any other interesting facts about Shakespeare that you would like to share with us? Definitely. Did you know that Shakespeare used more than 25,000 words and invented phrases that are used even today in popular conversation? Note that an average person uses only 1,000 words in general conversation. So it is because of such desire for new ways of expressing thoughts that we have a deeper, richer language and also new jargon. How can we encourage people to develop the skills that literary geniuses possess? I would suggest that they read many great works of literature, for example, Shakespeare's plays or poetry. Every genius has a mentor or a powerful guide to influence him or her. I also believe that people should live their lives with conviction and produce creative works by writing love songs, poetry, or even painting. This method supports most of da Vinci's secrets of acquiring greater intelligence. Let's now consider Albert Einstein, 
a mathematics and physics genius. Did his genius show itself in early childhood, or did he develop it later in life? When he was five years old, his father gave him a pocket compass. He immediately realized that there was something in the empty space that moved the needle. This observation left a lasting impression on his mind. Do highly intelligent children have a clearer understanding of situations or some sort of superior memory? Is that what sets them apart? Yes. They differentiate themselves from others with great originality of thought. For example, when Einstein was six years old, he began violin lessons and built models and mechanical devices for fun. When he was at school, he developed a strong liking for mathematics, but he hated the way it was taught by teachers, using strict learning methods. Is there any way that we can encourage our children to strive for higher goals? There are many ways. I would advise families to switch off the TV, as it's not a creative activity. I also think that it's a good idea to encourage children to read a variety of books. Thirdly, parents should play many different types of music. These activities provide a stimulating environment for children and encourage them to think creatively. So, it seems that creativity and the role of the environment are crucial in becoming a genius. Certainly, but a positive self-image is very important too. These children often carry a little notebook or PDA to write down creative ideas and thoughts based on their observations. Yet most importantly, these super-intelligent children ask many questions and they are extremely imaginative. But don't assume that it's all work and no play for them. They also have fun and enjoy life to the full. Thank you for a most interesting discussion. Unit 11. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions 1 to 8, choose the best answer, A, B or C. 1. You overhear a conversation at a cafe. What is the woman trying to do? A. Criticise. B. Offer help. C. Give a warning. been sleeping well the last few weeks because of my exams. I also drink a lot of coffee, which doesn't help. I've tried all sorts of things to make me sleep better. I tried drinking chamomile tea, drinking warm milk. I even count sheep. Nothing helps. I just lay awake all night worrying about the exam I have in the morning. That's terrible. You shouldn't get so stressed about your exams. I know, but what can I do to get some sleep? You know, since I started putting a few drops of lavender oil on my pillow, I've been sleeping like a baby. Really? I might try that. Here, take this lavender oil and try it tonight. I'm sure it will help you. Two. You will hear a school counsellor talking about the problem of homesickness. What advice does he give? A. Visit your family more often. B. See a doctor. C. Change your habits. The first point that must be emphasised is that feeling a little bit depressed when you are first away from home is a completely normal reaction. You should not think that you have a serious problem and that you need to see a specialist. We all miss our family and friends in such a situation. However, it is a mistake to think that this feeling will just go away. You must take some positive steps. Begin by calling or visiting home less often. Next, look for new friends. Three, you overhear a conversation between two people. What does the man think about what the woman says? A. It is a lie. B. It is based on personal experience. C. It is unconvincing. I saw it with my own eyes. Calm down. I'm not calling you a liar. What I am saying is that you wanted to believe this and told yourself that it was true. 
Not at all. I am absolutely sure that our mind can control our body and that people can run across burning hot coals without getting hurt. Have you tried it yourself? Well, not exactly. Four. You hear part of a radio program. Who is speaking? A. A doctor. B. A research scientist. C. A philosopher. Thank you for asking me that. Scientists and philosophers have been arguing for centuries about whether or not the mind can make the body sick. Such illnesses or disorders are known as psychosomatic, and the current debate focuses on the biochemical makeup of the mind. But here, in a very, very busy hospital, I basically only have time to treat what I see. The exploration of deeper matters is more for research scientists. Five. You overhear a conversation outside a cinema. What does the woman think about the film? A. It is depressing. B. It shouldn't be part of the festival. C. It is worth seeing. Oh, look at that poster! I've heard about that film. I haven't. What is it about? It begins with a man in a police cell who is being interviewed about the death of his family. But why is it in a festival about mental health? Well, while the police are interviewing him, they realise that he has a kind of amnesia where you lose the memory of what has happened after and not before an accident. That sounds interesting. Why don't we go and see it? Six. You overhear a conversation between two colleagues. What activity does the woman like? A. Doing crossword puzzles. B. Doing logic puzzles. C. Reading. The mind is a muscle. Like all the other muscles in your body, it needs to be exercised regularly. How do you suggest I exercise my mind? Well, there are all kinds of ways. Reading a book is a good one. Doing crossword puzzles, Sudoku, logic puzzles. Why don't you buy a puzzle book to do? I do like reading when I have the time, but I don't really enjoy doing puzzles. Most people don't like exercising, but they still do it because they know it's good for them. Oh well, when you put it like that, pass me the newspaper. I'll try the crossword. Seven. You hear a man talking about how he became interested in the computer game Second Life. What does he intend to do? A. Stop playing the game. B. Continue playing the game. C. Design a similar game. Well, how did I get hooked on Second Life? You know, I had been playing similar video and computer games since I was a teenager, and I think that it was just a continuation of that. Second Life offers so much, and your only real limit is your own imagination or lack of it. I just wish I were clever enough to design something like it myself, but I think I will keep to the character I have made for myself on it. Eight. You overhear a conversation between two neighbours. What point is the woman trying to make? A. Her son should always be excused. B. Her son is undoubtedly intelligent. C. Her son is a musical genius. Well, they say playing classical music can make your child more intelligent. So I've played Mozart to Harry since he was a baby. And look at how he's turned out. Yes. Well, maybe he doesn't have much common sense. Breaking your front window with a football was an accident, and he can be a bit lazy. But that has nothing to do with intelligence. My Harry is very intelligent. He can speak three languages, and he plays the drums and the guitar. Yes, I know. I could hear him last night when I was trying to sleep.
Unit 12. You will hear a radio interview with an expert on aromatherapy. For questions 1 to 7, choose the best answer, A, B or C. Good evening and welcome to the show. Elizabeth Mitchell is here today to talk about the use of aromatherapy to improve athletic performance. So Elizabeth, tell us, what exactly is aromatherapy? Thank you. Aromatherapy is the use of essential oils for health purposes. Essential oils are found in various plants, flowers and trees. These oils have important minerals, vitamins and antiseptics that are good for us. How long has aromatherapy been around? Aromatherapy has been around for over 6,000 years. The Greeks, Romans and Egyptians all used aromatic oils in medical treatments. In fact, the father of medicine, Hippocrates, used essential oils to get rid of the plague in Athens. Modern aromatherapy came into effect in 1930, when a French chemist discovered the healing benefits of various essential oils. And during World War II, a French army surgeon used essential oils as antiseptics. These days, many athletes use all kinds of nutritional supplements in the form of food or drinks to help improve their performance. Is it true that essential oils can also be used for the same purpose? Yes, it is. In fact, it's all to do with our noses. Out of the five different senses, taste, hearing, sight, touch, smell is the most sensitive. Smells produce the quickest reaction from the brain. When we smell something, messages are transported from our nose to the part of the brain which controls emotions and memories. As a result, it is thought that certain smells produce emotional responses. It's well known that what you eat or drink before and after you do exercise can affect how your body performs. But now researchers have discovered that certain scents can also affect your fitness. In particular, peppermint oil has been found to have a very strong impact on performance. Is there any scientific evidence to prove this? In an experiment, athletes were asked to run on a treadmill while inhaling one of the following scents. Peppermint, jasmine, and a gas with no smell which was used as a control. It was found that the athletes who sniffed the peppermint experienced an increase in nasal and lung dilation. Also, they felt more motivated to keep running for longer than the athletes in the other groups. The peppermint put the athletes in a good mood and when we feel good about doing something, we're more likely to do it better. And is peppermint the only scent that can improve performance? Although the results with mint are very good, there are other options. Cinnamon, rosemary and basil are thought to improve concentration. Jasmine is an excellent muscle relaxant, which can be used during the cool-down stage of your workout. Lavender is well known for its relaxing effects on the body and mind. A drop of lavender on your pillow at night will help you sleep. A good night's sleep can help you perform better in sports. How do we use essential oils? I recommend you just put a few drops on a tissue and simply inhale. If you're working out at home, you could put one or two drops into a bowl of water. The important thing to note is that only a few drops are needed because the oils are very strong. And if you use too much, you could have a bad reaction such as a headache or if you suffer from asthma, it could bring on an attack. Also, it's important to make sure you are using good quality oils, so do your research before you buy. Well, that has been very useful. If you are just joining us, I'm talking to Elizabeth. five different people talking about diets they or people they know have tried. Choose from the list A to F 
the statement that best describes each diet. Use the letters only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. One. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine suggested that I try a new all-natural diet that claimed I would lose five kilos in a week. Of course, I jumped at the chance to lose weight quickly. What my friend didn't tell me was that I would have to eat cabbage soup twice a day for seven days and didn't allow me to eat much else. Needless to say, I didn't make it past the third day. And I never want to see cabbage again. Speaker 2 My sister thought it would be a good idea to go on a diet to lose the weight she had put on over the winter. She had read somewhere about a miracle fruit that slims your waistline in no time. This miracle fruit was grapefruit, and she would consume three per day, either in juice, fruit salad, or by itself. She also had to cut out snacks, complex carbohydrates, and drink several glasses of water daily. She was pleasantly surprised with the results and recommends it to all her friends. Speaker 3 I'm currently on a diet that my doctor suggested I try. I've always been on the chubby side, so I decided that it was time that I try a diet. My doctor had just returned from a weight loss conference in Canada and he told me to try drinking two to three teaspoons of apple cider vinegar before every meal. At first I thought he was joking, but when he explained to me that the fermenting apples have pectin, which helps to speed up the digestion process, I tried it. So far I have lost two kilos and I am really happy with the results. Speaker 4 My wife was trying to lose weight last year, and she went to a new age dietitian for some counselling. Well, this woman was right out of her head because she told my wife to try a new idea called breatharianism. Its main belief is that eating is an acquired habit and that air and sunlight should be the primary form of nourishment. She told my wife to train her body to survive on little or no food and to breathe very deeply. Well, the first day was surprisingly effortless, but the second day I could see my wife was eyeing my chicken dinner with envy. The third day I came home to find my wife on the floor. She was so weak she had passed out from lack of food. I rushed her to the hospital and since then she's been eating proper meals and exercising regularly. Speaker 5 I've tried many diets in my day and I can honestly say that none of them have worked for me with the exception of one. Technically speaking, it isn't exactly a diet. It has to do with chewing. It is called the multi-bite diet and it encourages you to chew all your food until it becomes liquid. This aids in the process of informing the brain that you are no longer hungry. It is said that the brain requires 20 minutes to get the signal from your stomach that it is full and as such, the process of prolonged chewing doesn't allow for overeating. I still practice it to this very day. Speaker 